All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Welcome again to Bethany ARP. We come together for Sabbath school this morning. Our uh, lesson is going to come to us from the 21st chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, but uh, before getting all that, let's go ahead and go uh, to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Great study, Father, we give thanks again for this day and this time that you give unto us. We pray that you would bless uh, the work of the Holy Spirit as we come together to learn more of your word and the way of your truth. You might in every way uh, give us a testimony uh, that we might live in life of your gospel grace. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, of course, before we get into to the lesson, we have our catechism question for today, which is Lord's Day 36 uh, from the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, the question is surrounding the third commandment. Uh, question 99, what is required in the third commandment? The, that we must not by cursing or by false swearing, nor yet by unnecessary oaths, profane or abuse the name of God, nor even by our silence and connivance be partakers of those horrible sins in others. And in summary, that we use the holy name of God in no other way than with fear and reverence, so that he might be rightly confessed and worshipped by us and be glorified in all our words and works. Question 100, is, this prof is the profaning of God's name by swearing and cursing so grievous a sin that uh, his wrath uh, is kindled against those who also do not help as much as they can to hinder and forbid it? Yes, truly, for no sin is greater and more provoking to God than the profaning of his name. Wherefore, he even commanded it to be punished with death. All right, so... You know, as the catechism is working its way through the, uh, the uh, Ten Commandments, uh, we get two questions on the Third Commandment. Third Commandment obviously is, Thou shalt not use the Lord's, uh, the, name, uh, uh, the Lord's name in vain. And as part of that testimony, we are reminded in the catechism today uh, that uh, using the Lord's name in vain is more than just saying bad words. Uh, it's more than uh, just uh, using words that our culture has deemed uh, to be inappropriate. You know, that this has a lot more to do uh, with the way that we live as much as it has to do with how we speak. And one of the main characters of a violation of the third commandment is that we take unlawful oaths and vows. Now, one of the ways we see that in the scriptures, uh, an unlawful oath and vow, uh, we can uh, see that you know, there was a time that Moses made a deal uh, with one of the tribes uh, as they were going through the wilderness, and God uh, pulled him to the side and said, hey, you're not allowed to kind of you know, you know, go on your own way and make deals uh, that I have not commended. Now, you know, we don't often run into that trouble today. I don't know how many of us are in the wilderness or... Uh, dealing with tribes in that way, but all right, when you think of unlawful oaths and vows in the context of 2024, you know, one of the things we need to be careful of is that um, if we take a vow in the church, right, if we're taking a membership vow or if we are uh, you know, you know, taking a vow of baptism or we're taking a vow of church membership or if, you know, not necessarily in church context, but you know, it, it usually happens in the church, right? When we make a vow at our wedding, you know, that we will love, cherish, and all that kind of stuff, that we mean it when we say it. Right? Christians are to be known for, if Christians are known for anything, it should be known that we keep our word. So when we make a vow, it is incumbent upon us, in light of the third commandment, that we keep whatever that vow is, and that we don't enter into vows that we don't intend on keeping. Because not only are you lying to yourself, but of course you're lying to God. Now, as the third commandment is laid out here in, in question 99, it says, first of all, we must by cursing or by false swearing. Now, the cursing, obviously, that uh, they have in mind here is not foul language. Now, should you use foul language? Probably not. But that's not a violation of the third commandment. Right? Paul will talk about uh, that Christians are not to use vulgar language. Right, that we we are to be uh, you know clean speaking, but again, when the third commandment here is talking about cursing, it's talking about you know the kind of stuff that you, know, you used to hear about you know generations ago, right? Where you would place a curse on somebody. Right now, back in the 16th century, when this is written. The primary way you would do that is you would go to the local uh, witch doctor 
uh, which there were plenty of you know old ladies in the Reformation area era in Europe who were engaged in processing curses for you. So you would go to the local you know witch doctor and you know you would tell her that uh, so and so is getting ready to get married to a girl you like and that you don't want to see it happen so you pay her money and she does an incantation against that guy uh, so that something bad happens to him so you get to marry the girl. Now, you know, that might sound silly, but that was happening all the time in medieval Europe. Uh, people were going to uh, you know, these types of places. And so the catechism is expressly concerned that Reformed Christians, first of all, don't go to mediums and don't go to witch doctors and don't go to palm readers and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, one of the things we see in the scriptures is that are we to return evil for evil? No, right? We are, uh, if somebody reviles or curses you, how are we to respond? And with grace, with mercy, and with love, right? Even if the flesh is telling you that the right thing to do in that moment is to curse back, right? We are to withhold ourselves from that. And again, one of the things that the Ten Commandments is trying to teach us is that we are to become more and more in conformity with God, right? We're to be more and more like God. Now, how has God treated us in our cursing of Him? Right? Mercy and grace, right? He has shown mercy to us, and so we are to show mercy to those who revile us. And that's what, again, one of the things that the catechism is trying to, to, to get Christians to think about, that we are not to live as the world, we're not to be as the world, we are to be as Christ. Now, one of the reasons why uh, we are not to curse is told us in question 100. Is refaming of God's name by swearing and cursing so grievous a sin that his wrath is kindled against those who also who do not help uh, as much as they can to hinder and forbid it? Yes, truly, for no sin is greater or more provoking to God than the profaning of his name, wherefore he even commanded to be punished with death. Now, the other aspect of that uh, that the catechism wants us to understand is that if we see somebody getting ready to make a vow that they shouldn't, what should we do? Well, whatever was within our power, um, we should stop them from uh, making that vow. Now, uh, the way we're probably most familiar with this requirement is in the old, uh, you know, wedding uh, formula. Right? You know, back in back in the old days, what did the preacher say after he got done welcoming everybody to the to the wedding? That's all right. If anybody knows the reason why these two can't be joined together, let him now speak or forever hold his peace. Now, you know, there are you know, mostly not good reasons why we don't say that anymore, but right, why, why would they put that in the marriage, in, in the opening of the marriage book? Right? Because if you knew there was a reason why these two people should get married, you better speak up, right? Because they're entering into a lifelong vow together. And the goal of every vow is that it should be kept. Now the primary concern back in those days was is that you know, our records weren't as uh, transferable as they are nowadays. So you know, if you married some girl in Ohio in 1840 and you ran off from her and moved to Wyoming or wherever right, and wanted to get married again, right, would anybody be able to, to check? Well, no. Right? So you know, you know, they were trying to prevent bigamy and all that kind of stuff. And so those things were added to the vows to ensure that the law wasn't getting broken. Now, the catechism is concerned with that, right? Because the civil law should be as much a part of our concern as the moral law. And so keeping the third commandment, again, involves a lot more than just merely not shouting the Lord's name when you hit your knee on something, right? Yeah, it involves, again, everything that we do and say that we ensure that we keep you know, our vow and keep our oath. And we'll kind of close on that. But any questions or comments? All right, well, let's go ahead and go to the 21st chapter of the book of Acts as uh, we uh, turn now to uh, Paul's continuing missionary journey. Uh, remember uh, when we left him off uh, before, his goal was to go to Jerusalem. So... He has, uh, you know, the main reason he's going to Jerusalem is he's been taking up offerings for the church of Jerusalem, and he wants to make sure they get there. 
So he's taking them himself. So as we begin in chapter 21, the, um, the, the, the passage tells us this. Now it came to pass that when uh, we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul that through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Now, this is the opening uh, kind of testimony of their trip uh, back to Jerusalem. So the first thing we hear is that you know, they're heading from you know, the Grecian islands towards, uh, the, uh, and towards you know, you know, Israel. Now, as they're going, right, they go to Cox, they go to Rhodes, uh, they go to Patera. So they're going down past the island of Crete, and now they're sailing uh, towards Cyprus. Now, when they get to Cyprus, it says they passed uh, on the left. Now, you know, what is, what is that, which side of the island are they on then, if they're passing on the left? If you're, you're heading east and you're passing something on the left, that means you're passing the southern side of uh, the island, right? So they've come down, and now they're on the south side of the island, and they're getting ready to shoot down towards uh, Syria. So it tells us that as they pass the island, they shoot down towards Syria, and they get to, to Syria. Now, at this point in time, it, they call it Phoenicia, right? And, uh, but it's the same kind of place, basically modern Lebanon. Uh, come down towards it, we get to Tyre, uh, for there was the ship was to unload her cargo. And then as they get there, who are the first people they seek uh, and find out? Where's the first place they go? They go to church, right? Uh, how else are they going to find fellow disciples, right? So they go to church. Now it tells us as they go to church, uh, how long did they stay? Seven days. Now, you know, there are a couple of reasons why they would have stayed seven days. One, if you've been on ship for like a month, uh, what are you not super interested in doing? <laughs> Getting back on a ship or going anywhere, right? You need some recovery time. Uh, so that's one reason why they are uh, stopping here uh, for seven days. Obviously, they need recovery time. But also, you know, what, what, what takes seven days? a week to happen. Church, right? You know, they have met these fellow disciples in the city of Tyre and they want to worship with them. Right? They, they're interested in uh, providing the gospel of grace and, and speaking to these fellow believers that they might uh, in every way come to a knowledge of the truth. And so they stay for seven days, right? We see something here in Tyre about the nature of Christian hospitality. Right? Now, do these people in Tyre have any idea that Paul and these folks were coming? Right? There's, no, there's no intimation here that Paul had sent a letter ahead letting them know. Right? So they need somewhere to stay. They need someone to feed them. They need somebody to help them uh, you know, you know, make the you know, trip and all that kind of stuff. And... Do we get any sense that the people at Tyre are mad because they have to take care of Paul and his companions for a week? No. In fact, we have the opposite testimony, right? You know, they almost get a sense they don't want them to leave. Right? They, uh, you know, they, they are enjoying one another's company, right? They see, so again, we see something about the nature of Christian fellowship, the nature of Christian hospitality, uh, that the church should always be open to help, you know, especially travelers, uh, and that uh, also if you're traveling and you are not at Bethany on the Lord's Day, what, you know, what should you seek out while you're traveling? You know, a church, somewhere to worship on the Lord's Day, right? Because um, you know, it, you know, the moral law doesn't take vacation when you're on vacation, right? They, uh, you know, the desire for Christians should be to worship on the day that God has set aside for worship. So... That's a lot easier nowadays, right? Because if you're going somewhere on vacation, what can you do? Yeah, well, you can tune in here, but you know that 
<laughs> that's not the primary you know, way that we need to be worshiping. But n nowadays, what can you do if you're traveling somewhere? Look on the internet, right? Get on Google uh, and put in the city you're going to be at and say, Reformed Church in whatever, right? Now, you know, it's even easier than that. Uh, you know, I have access to a Google page, like a Google Maps page, that has every confession form church in the United States listed on it. Um, and it, um, you know, and, you know, so it lists, uh, you know, the little tag thingies that show up on Google Maps, right? You, you know, the tag is the uh, denominational seal of whatever that denomination is. Uh, you know, even has Reformed Baptists on there. Uh, so if you can't find a Presbyterian Reformed place, you can, you can hang out with the Baptist for Sunday. You won't get cooties or anything, I promise. But, right, you know, they worship the same Jesus we do, so, right? You're going to get fed and all that good stuff. But, right, so if you're traveling, you can pop that thing up. You can find a church nearby, and you can set aside time to worship the Lord our God. And that's something we see here in the natural order of things in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Everywhere he goes, you know, if there's no church, where does he go? He goes to synagogue, Right? Because he's a, he's a missionary, he's an evangelist, he wants to bring people to the word of Christ. But if there's a church, which one does he choose? The church, right? Because he wants to be around fellow believers. Right? He doesn't know these people from Adam, you know, as we used to say. I don't hear people say that as much anymore. But, right? He doesn't know these people from Adam, but he knows that they are followers of Jesus, right? So they immediately have a connection that is stronger than even blood. Right? That's one of the things Jesus tells the disciples, remember, when he's training them for missionary work later on, is that they uh, might be losing, you know, mother, father, brother, sisters, uh, but what are they gaining? Well, a thousand fold more uh, than what they lost, right? So when we think of our brothers and sisters in Christ, right, I, I have two sisters, right? but how many sisters in Christ do I have? Billions. You know, and you think about the, the cloud of witnesses that have gone before, right? You get into a lot more than that. But again, Paul here is witnessing to us to the ordinary manner of life that his goal, everywhere he goes, is to be around fellow believers and to worship with them. That's again why Luke tells us of this seven-day pattern, the seven-day waiting. All right? So after they get done worshiping and fellowshipping and hospitalizing and all that good stuff, uh, the day came uh, to depart, and they went. Uh, we went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children. We were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Now, you know, first before that, you know, we hear that um, you know they're not 100 percent sure uh, they need to be going. But you know, as they're leaving, what do they take time to do? Do Christian stuff, right? They bow down and they pray with one another, right? They ask blessings upon the trip uh, that is to come, right? And again, this is part of this ordinary Christian stuff that we uh, should be doing, you know, in the natural order of things in our life, right? When we get ready to go on a trip, what should we do? We should pray, right? We should ask the Lord's blessings upon this trip, right? You know, that's one of the things about living in the modern world uh, is that, you know, we put a lot of faith uh, in ourselves and in our uh, modern conveniences, right? Um, but, you know, what happens sometimes to modern conveniences? They break, they get lost, they get tore up, right? And so you think it's a good idea to ask the Lord's help you know, if, for a, a trip. Right? Again, it, it, it's not complicated, right? It's not something that's super hard, but it's a testimony again that your faith and trust is not in yourself or in your car or your phone it's in the Lord your God the providence you provide for you on a trip and again it's important to know that they're not praying by themselves right this is the whole congregation and not just the men right but the wives and the children have come out uh, to wish of them well again uh, another sign of that hospitality and that love that they have for one another All right so as they finish this in verse 7 it says and when he had finished our voice from Tyre we came to Ptolemaeus greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. All right. So again, they go to Ptolemaeus, who do they find? They find the brethren in Ptolemaeus. So on the next day, we, or Paul's companions, departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now, 
here, they go from this place to this place, and here's Mr. Philip, right? Philip has had a long career in the book of Acts, right? When we first meet him, right, he is a man of, uh, of, of action, right? a man of plan. He's one of the seven chosen to be a deacon, you know, in Acts chapter 6. One of the things we know about Philip is that he was a man of prayer, he was a man of spiritual wealth, uh, he was a man who loved the Lord, and that's why he was chosen to be a deacon. Now, after his deaconhood, you know, the Lord gives him another call. Right? He goes from being a deacon to being an evangelist. Right? Now, there are plenty of folks who, you know, who uh, are called to be a deacon for one season of life and are called to be an elder in another season of life, and then you know, the Lord calls them to be a preacher. You know, one of the uh, you know, men that we ordained last summer, uh, Greg Delaney, uh, Greg Delaney, you know, he's 65 years old, and he felt the call to ministry. And he went to seminary, and he went through all that, and you know, he recognized that his, age, his time in life is not to be an installed pastor of church, but to be an evangelist. And so we ordained a 67-year-old man to be an evangelist, and so what does he do every Sunday? He evangelizes. That's what he does. He, uh, now, what he mostly does is go to our small churches who you know, don't have installed ministers, and he is able you know, to preach and do the sacraments and, and the like, but... You know, when he's not in there in the pulpit, that's what he's doing every Sunday, is evangelizing, right? And we see this with Philip, right? He has been called uh, to the ministry. Uh, we see this witnessed, of course, because remember, it's Philip who meets with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And gives him a sense of the book of Isaiah. And then, you remember, what does he do to the Ethiopian eunuch? He baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch, remember? And so, does a deacon have the authority to baptize him? No, right? So we know that while Luke doesn't tell us, at some point in time between Acts chapter 6 and the Egypt of Munich, right, Philip received this call. Now it's evident that Philip has remained faithful because Paul goes to see him. Right? And he goes to his house, and we're told here that uh, he you know, stayed with him. In verse 9 it says, Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we were stayed many days, a certain prophet came, named Agabus came down from Judea, when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So uh, when he would not be persuaded and cease saying the will of the Lord, uh, be done. Now, you know, it's one of these cases in the Bible where, um, you know, there's some interesting things happen. Right? And, uh, you know, probably the least interesting in, in the scheme of things is the fact that we're told that uh, Philip had four daughters who prophesied. Now, you know, what do we do with that? Well, one of the things you have to you learn when you come to the Bible, right, is that uh, when we have a question on a passage, you know, we don't ever take a passage on its own. We have to understand that you know, the whole Bible is written and has one common theme, one common testimony. Now, at first glance, what does it sound like the daughters of, of, uh, of Philip are doing? What does the prophet do? Talk about God, right? And preaches. Now, what do we know about what God has said about the order of his church? Right? The office minister is not open you know, to women, right? We know that because that's what the Old Testament teaches, that's what the New Testament teaches. So, you know, if we know that Philip is a faithful man of God, is he going to allow his daughters to break the law of God? No. So, we know that this mean, doesn't mean that they are preachers. However, you know, one of the things that prophets do throughout the Old and New Testaments is they tell people about God. Right? But also one of the things they do is their prayer words. And one of the promises that, that we hear in the beginning of the book of Acts uh, is a, a quotation of the prophecy made in Joel chapter 2 that their sons and daughters will prophesy. Right? Now, one of the things about prophesying is that you know, everybody can prophesy. Because what's everybody called to do? Everybody's called to pray. Everybody's called to witness uh, for the Lord, right? So these women, 
these virgin daughters are testified to be close to the Lord, right? They are testified to be followers of Jesus, that they love the Lord more than life itself. And so these, uh, uh, they, these daughters, right, uh, they you know, greet uh, Paul just like him, right? And these four daughters are prophesying. As we stay many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, you know, what, what gender is Agabus? In, in, in Greek and Latin, right, if U.S. is at the end of the word, you know, that's referring to a man. Right? If an A is at the end of the word, right, that's referring uh, to a woman. So Agabus is a man. He comes down and he you know, comes to Paul. Notice, which of the five prophets speaks to Paul? Agabus, right? Because what's the difference between Agabus and uh, the four daughters? It's not just the fact that one's man and the other are women, right? Um, which one of them has authority and which of them doesn't? Right? Agabus does, right? So Agabus, having received the same vision that the daughters had, Agabus comes down and speaks to him, and he does kind of an interesting thing. You know, what does he do? He takes Paul's belt off, right? And, you know, what does he do with Paul's belt? Right? He wraps it around the thing and as a visual demonstration that you know, he is bound to tell Paul that he needs to stay out of Jerusalem. Now, again, the book of Acts is a narrative. It's a story of what happened. Right? Sometimes people like Paul do things that God tells them not to do. What should Paul have done at this point in time? They should have listened to the prophet Agabus, right? Because God's telling him that he should not go to Jerusalem. Because what's going to happen to him if he goes to Jerusalem? He's going to get bound. He's going to get arrested. Now, guess what happens? Right? Paul gets arrested. So, verse 15 tells us, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain uh, Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went with, in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, uh, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and are zealous for the law. But they have been informed by you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children or walk nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified within, and pay their expenses to them. They shave their heads, and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Now, you know, this is all very curious, right? Because this happens in Acts 21. Uh, where was all this decided? Remember, this is all decided in Acts 15. Um, now, uh, you know, who was present in Acts 15? Well, Paul was, right? Why does James feel the need to, to tell Paul any of this? Because evidently there has been some backsliding in Jerusalem. Right? Because Acts 15 decided that, you know, what was, were you supposed to follow the customs of the, of the Jews? Were Jews or Gentiles supposed to follow the customs of the Jews? But evidently what's happened? You know, in Paul's absence, they slid back into some of these, you know, the Jewish Christians are to do this and the Gentile Christians do this. And that's not what they agreed to in Acts 15, right? So, again, it's important to recognize the book of Acts that there are things that happen that shouldn't happen, but do happen. And Luke tells us what happened, not what he would have liked to have happened. That's one of the reasons why we can rest and trust in the authority of the Scriptures, right? Because, you know, do you need, you know, if you're writing a letter to somebody and they ask how you are, uh, do you often put every jot and tittle of everything bad you've done in the, in the past you know, six months since the last time we talked to him. 
Right? That's not usually how we, we talk to people. But Luke is telling us exactly what happened because this is what happened. And so not, in, in, in the middle of this chapter, we not only have Paul disobeying you know, the command of the Lord, but evidently the Jerusalem church is getting kind of wonky a little bit. Now, in verse 26, we hear that Paul took the men the next day, having been purified within, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, in which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people of the law in this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks in the temple and is the father of the holy place. Now, of course, the irony is, is, has Paul been teaching that you don't need to be circumcised to be a Christian? Yes, right? That is exactly, right? You know, it's, it's kind of funny, right? The, the people telling the truth about what Paul teaches is the Jews trying to kill him. And the people who are supposed to be his friends have been massaging what he's been teaching, right? You know, they've been trying to tell the Jews that Paul wasn't saying that you don't need to be circumcised and you don't need to follow the ceremonial law of Moses. And here's Paul, what does he do when he comes to the temple? He preaches the very thing that James and the other disciples said as he wasn't. And of course, the Jews get all mad about it because they don't like the message of the gospel, right? They are angry at Paul for what he is doing. So in verse 29, for they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple, and all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and, and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when uh, they could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded to be taken to the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. And the multitude of the people followed him, uh, crying away, away with him. Now, you know, this sounds like something that's happened before in Jerusalem, isn't it? Uh, not only is this what happened to Jesus, but this, of course, what happened to Peter and John way back in the beginning of the book of Acts. Right? The mob was trying to kill them, and the Roman soldiers came and, and saved them. And, of course, the big difference between Paul and Peter and John you know, is what? What's, what's the biggest difference between Peter and John and Paul? You know, especially something that's going to be very important in, in Paul's life. For the rest of the book of Acts. He's a Roman citizen, right? And that affords him certain legal rights that Peter and John did not have. Right? That's one of the reasons why Peter and John were, were given up to the Sanhedrin, right? Because they're Jews. Now Paul is a Jew for certain, but you know what what's far more important than the Roman Empire? Right? Citizenship. And so it provides help for of Paul as he's going through this. Now, as we'll see, right, and, and, you know, I don't think we're in chapter 22 next week, but um, the, in chapter 22, Paul you know, invokes his Roman citizenship. And the, the soldiers get all mad at Paul, right? Because what are the soldiers not supposed to be doing to Roman citizens? Yeah, they're, 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 they're not supposed to be imprisoning Roman citizens. They're not to be beating Roman citizens, right? Roman citizens have rights that the Jews don't have. And in Rome, you know, in the Roman legal system, to beat a Roman citizen would have been the same as to beat Caesar himself, right? Because you're identified, right, with Caesar, right? That's your protection, in these things. And so in verse 37 it says, Then as Paul was about to be led in the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out of the wilderness? Right? Um, you know, talk about being uh, confused for somebody. Right? You know, <clears throat> then you know, he's first of all concerned he speaks Greek, right? Because what are the crowds speaking while it, all this commotion is going? Right, they're speaking Aramaic, right, which would have been the the the, the language of you know the normal Jew, you know, 
Um, but Paul, of course, that's not his native tongue. Right? He's Roman citizens. What does he speak? He's Greek. And so he you know, that speak Greek, and then he gets accused of something pretty wild, right? You ever get arrested, uh, and the uh, sheriff's deputy, the first thing he asks you is, "Are you one, are you the leader of the are you the Egyptian who stirred up a rebellion and led four thousand assassins in the wilderness?" Right? I got to be honest with you, I'd kind of be you know, impressed with myself at that moment in time that the sheriff's deputy would think I would be capable <laughs> of, of such a thing, right? But of course, that's not who Paul is. And it's important to note here that there are a lot of commotion in Judea in the first century A.D. There are a lot of people running around claiming to be the Messiah. There are a lot of people running around trying to lead rebellions against Rome. And what do you think Rome's attitude is towards all of these rabble outlets? You think they're kind of fed up with them, right? kind of tired of all the commotion uh, going on in Judea? Uh, you know, it's worthwhile to remember that if you were a Roman commander, uh, where would you not want to be sent? Right. You were in Judea because you got in trouble somewhere else. Right. Uh, you know, when I was in the Marines, you know, Marines, one of the big things Marines do, of course, is do security guard work. You know, the embassies all around the world, and you know, I looked into doing that, and I was meeting with a recruiter on that, and. Uh, while I was still in the Marines, and he was telling me, he was like, you know, you get two duty stations, right? You know, you, you go somewhere not fun, and then your last bit is somewhere fun, right? Well, one of my friends did that. He ended up being an uh, embassy guard in the nation of Djibouti. Now, does anybody know where that is? <laughs> well, I, it's, it's on the Horn of Africa. Uh, there's probably not a place on planet Earth that is less fun to be uh, than a small little desert place on the Horn of Africa where you know you can't exactly go out of the embassy. So when you're an embassy guard in Djibouti, you're in the embassy for like two years. Like you can't leave the embassy because things are so dangerous. Now, you know, imagine if you're a Roman soldier and you get assigned to Judea. Right? You know, I, I'm sure, you know, and there's records of this, that Roman soldiers actually deserted rather than go to Judea because of how bad things were there. Now, Paul here, as he is trying to make sure that this guy understands that he's not a leader of 4,000 assassins, says in verse 39, but Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus, Cilicia, a, cit a, a citizen of the no mean city, and I implore you permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and both his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. So, now, I don't know why the man who divided the Bible up into chapters and verses decided to put the chapter ending right here because, you know, yeah, I mean, I guess he liked cliffhangers. Right? It's about, about the only thing I can think of here. But that's where the chapter ends. Uh, with Paul saying, you know, hey, let me talk to him. So we don't have time to get all into chapter 22, but basically he preaches the gospel to all these people and guess what they respond with? Right? They want to kill him again. Right? But Paul, again, wants to have this last second chance to preach the gospel uh, to these people. Now, they rebel. They scream and yell at him and they cuss at him and do all kinds of nasty things. And the commander basically pulls him back into the barracks and keeps him safe. Now, you know, a lot more happens after that. We'll have to close there for this morning. But again, one of the main messages of Acts 21 is that, you know, that church work is... Uh, not always clean, right? That there are times where, you know, you yourself, whether you're a minister, whether you're a member of the church, does things that God tells you not to. And it's worth noting that, you know, the men who founded the church of the Lord Jesus Christ were sinners just like us, right? Were men with clay feet. And sometimes, you know, God used that for, you know, his blessing, right? Paul uh, had long dreamed of going to Rome, and how does he end up going to Rome? Because he disobeyed God, right? And he gets arrested, and he gets sent to Rome. But, you know, the Lord works all things for his glory and for his blessing. Now, the difficulties in the church at Jerusalem are something we hinted to in the book of Revelation uh, that continue to be somewhat of an issue. Uh, one of the reasons why it's an issue is because uh, the, you know, and this is true for missionaries 
today, right? It's easy to fall into the native situations in the culture that you are in. Right? And so missionaries, one of the things we do, right, is we pull them off the mission field after a certain number of years and give them, you know, furlough time in the States. Right? And the primary reason for that is not just to give them a break, it's to make sure that you know, they've not become, you know, kind of gone native, as, as it were, uh, in the land where they are, right? Because that's a, a, a temptation that all of us can face. So we'll kind of close on that. Any questions or comments about the 21st chapter book of Acts? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great, Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for the uh, way that you've given unto us your grace. And we pray that you would continue to encourage us to love the Lord Jesus and love his word and be watchful about uh, those times that uh, we can be led astray not only by ourselves but by the temptations and native to the flesh. And in Christ's name we pray.